Good evening. Occupy Wall Street. The movement appears to be strong, even growing, despite ice storms, arrests, and lack of leadership. What holds it together? Partly it's the mission, economic justice. But beneath that is the social infrastructure, which is a fascinating mixture of high and low tech. As you may have seen, demonstrators communicate with Robert's Rules of Order style hand signals. And since megaphones are prohibited in places like Zuccotti Park, they use the people's mic, where a speaker's words are repeated in unison by those who can hear, so everyone hears. Last week, an Occupy Chicago group turned up the volume on this technique to send a living wage message to Wisconsin's governor, Scott Walker, the guest speaker at Chicago's exclusive Union League Club. Remember, it was Walker who denied collective bargaining rights to his state's public employees. So the people's mic and democracy by hand signal, they are the low-tech side of Occupy Wall Street. Of course, the movement has spread via high-tech on Facebook and Twitter and other things, but some techies think the movement could benefit from more sophisticated tools. They've organized hackathons, intense brainstorming sessions, to create applications for activists. What have they come up with? Well, one tool might replace the people's mic. Joining us to explain is Andrew Grushevitz, a software engineer who works for Meetup.com. He organized a local hackathon for Occupy Wall Street. Thanks for coming. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. First, for the audience that's unfamiliar with the term, tell us more about what a hackathon actually is. So a hackathon is essentially a group of people coming together to develop a solution or just to have fun. Um, you know, it tends to be software. It could be hardware. It could be anything. Uh, Typically, they, they last for a long period of time because that's, you need a lot of time to get things done. Uh, and it's normally a lot of fun. But some of the fun ones are short, like weekend hackathons, competitive hackathons sure. held over two days to try to develop an app that's going to help the city in some way or that kind sure. of thing. Yeah, the, the New York City Big Apps is certainly something like that. Um, there's other things like the, the local hackathon that happened uh, maybe last weekend. Um, that, uh, a co-working space called General Assembly uh, put on, um, which essentially uh, tried to you know, create startups or create projects that would help local business. Um, it's funny that they call it General Assembly because that's the same term yeah. that Occupy Wall Street uses yes. for their political meetings. Exactly. So how did you get involved with Occupy Wall Street? Um, so uh, people at Meetup are you know, pretty into this idea of community. So uh, when Occupy Wall Street started, um, we were pretty excited about it because here it is, our, our mission of bringing people together to, to do something else, uh, to make some sort of political action or anything, you know, you know uh, better people by numbers, essentially, or better, better community, better things by numbers. Um, so um, I ended up seeing this blog, the We Are the 99% like Tumblr, uh, which is stories about people in financial crisis and, and things of that nature. And I kind of asked uh, our CEO, Scott Heiferman, what can we do here? Can we you know, somehow create a page or, or something where you know, we uh, um, sort of highlight the groups that are, the groups on Meetup that are helping you know, people deal with financial crisis and things of that nature? So for example, to replace or augment the people's mic, the thing that we demonstrated in the video, you developed something called the Shouty app. So yeah, one of my coworkers developed this, this app called Shouty, which essentially sets up a, um, a local internet streaming radio station that uh, people with a phone with wireless can uh, connect to and, and hear that. Um, I also understand that apps are in the works to help people deal with the problem of internet connectivity at Zuccotti Park. They don't have Wi-Fi? Um, so there is actually Wi-Fi now, the, the Free Network Foundation, um, an uh, organization started by a guy named Isaac Wilder uh, has been 
working to get this thing called the Freedom Tower up, which is an uplink uh, connectivity to the internet, uh, as well as other sites uh, around the country, and hopefully globally at some point in the future. What else is in the works that's relevant to Occupy? Um, lots of apps uh, for like rideshare, um, things like in the park, just uh, like a bulletin board system uh, that you know people that are right there can do. Sort of a I have a shower, you know, I can offer you a shower, I need a shower type things. Uh, just things like that to, to help community grow there. And there's an app called Getting Arrested? Uh, yeah, I'm Getting Arrested. So the basic idea is it's a, an Android app. There might be an iPhone app at this point. Uh, essentially, you put in uh, some numbers that you want to SMS at some point and a message. And if you think you're going to be arrested or are getting arrested, you open the app, hold down the big target button for two seconds and it sends those SMS messages uh, to the people that you specify. Does it make you feel like you're participating without actually going out and pitching a tent in the cold? Oh uh, yeah, to, to some degree. I mean, you know, building infrastructure, technical infrastructure is, is definitely something that needs to be done. Um, so getting people together to help do that, it's definitely part of the movement. And you run a group called Hack and Tell. Yeah. Tell us about that. So essentially, think kindergarten show and tell, uh, but for people who do projects on weekends. Um, so we give people five minutes to, you know, tell us about their project, and then we give uh, the audience five people or five minutes to, you know, give their feedback or you know, say how they can improve it or say why it sucks, essentially. And there we leave it. Thank you very much. Good Thank luck. You. Coming up after a break. No, not another tech bubble. Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. I'm lucky. Let me help you with that. I get to do something I love. It has nothing to do with touchdowns or titles. Everybody bring it in. I get to play a part in the life of someone just starting out. How many of you think homework is just as important as teamwork? I help keep kids in school. Good. And that's the name of the game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. One of the most important issues for the New York economy is whether the current explosion in internet companies will last or become another 90s-like bubble. Silicon Alley here could well become a well-paying sector like Wall Street, maybe even a buffer against Wall Street's ups and downs. But if high tech turns out to be a bubble, that's trouble. Our regular economy watcher, Greg David, who directs business journalism education here at the City University, is here to tell us about Groupon, the largest tech company to hit the stock exchange since Google. Hi, Greg. Welcome back. Thank you, Brian. And I guess a lot of people know about Groupon. It's the online coupon site that so many people have started to use. But there seemed to be a lot of confusion leading up to its initial public offering the other day, where first it was, oh, Groupon's going to be the biggest thing since Google, or, oh, Groupon's so overpriced, this is another bubble. How do we make sense of it? Well, there were a lot of problems with Groupon, including the fact they had to keep restating their financials. Um, they kept restating their revenue downwards. They halved it at one point because they were counting all the revenue they collected from people like me because I'm a Groupon subscriber, but they actually give half the revenue to the merchant who's offering the coupon. Uh, they had this enormous, they first announced a small loss. They told people to focus on this small loss because it turned out they didn't want anybody to look at their marketing expenses even though they're so huge. And then the CEO, in violation of every SEC rule known to man, sent a note out to his employees which told them all the reasons they were a great company mm. which got leaked to the press and violated all the quiet rules. So this was a rocky IPO. Nevertheless, it got released at a certain number of dollars per share, and it went straight up in the first minutes. Right. It was originally at 16 to 18 dollars a share. It was priced, which is what happens the night before they sell it at 20. It hit 30, and it came back and closed the first day at six. That's a market cap in the range of 16 billion dollars. 
But the fix was in. Mm. How does this compare to the 90s tech bubble and all those IPOs that were famously being released and making people instant billionaires at that time? Well, the pop wasn't as big, and there were many bigger pops uh, here in New York as well as everyone else. But in every other way, it was just like those 90s um, offerings. So you see, what they did is they offered this minuscule amount of shares, 35 million shares or 5% of the company. Now, even if you accept, and I think most people came to understand that Groupon was a really speculative uh, stock, there were still many more people who wanted to invest in it, even knowing the risks, than they offered the shares. So this is the fix. The first day pop is guaranteed. We do not know if large numbers of investors really like this company, and we won't know till they make subsequent stock offerings, which they'll have to do because they're losing so much money. I'm not sure I understand yet. The fix was in because the offering was such a small number of shares that they knew the demand was going to be high relative to the supply? Absolutely. And that's the, you know, I spent a couple months uh, studying the 90s in New York over the summer, and that's exactly what you do. You make the fix so the stock must go up because you don't offer offer enough shares. Um, I mean, most of the time in the 90s, nobody sold in the initial offering. I think with Groupon, some of the original investors sold. But they're losing so much money, they're going to have to keep offering stock. And as they offer stock, they will eventually reach the point where they've exhausted investor interest, at which point the stock will fall if it isn't becoming the next Google. If it becomes the next Google, then it's a good deal for everyone. If they aren't making money now, when everybody and his brother seems to be using the coupons, how are they going to make money in the future? They say they won't have to market. The reason is, is that once they have us in the database, and I'm now in their database, um, they won't need to spend much money acquiring me, and gradually they'll have enough people that their marketing expenses will go down. So that's the rationale according to Groupon. The opposite side of the story is they're getting enormous competitors. Everybody, every newspaper in America uh, is launching a competitive product in its home market. There are lots of other daily deal sites out there. We'll have to see if their first in advantage, which they have, will actually last. Um, they're in Chicago. They're right. not in New York. They're not in Silicon Valley. Is there a reason? Why they're in Chicago? Yeah. They just grew up there, you know? The guys were there, and it's been a big boon to Chicago. They employ 7,000 people now, most of them in Chicago. Actually, and 7, one of the- 7,000. 7,000, at least, and the money, numbers go up so much. On a money-losing company. On a money-losing company. Well, you know, somebody's got to write all those ads, you know? But they're in the old Montgomery Ward building, where Montgomery Ward was run for so many years on the outskirts of downtown Chicago. Is there a lesson for New York? I don't think we're seeing the New York startups that have become famous, um, like Fresh Direct, Etsy, uh, some of the others, going public. Well, there are two important things to say here. The first important thing is we don't have a Groupon. You know, we don't have a Google, we don't have a Facebook, no, we don't have a Groupon. We don't have a company big. who's that big and that well known. The second question is whether the next tier, which we do have, will rush to market. And, you know, their names are, we've got the Guild Group, Fresh Direct, Etsy, The Ladders. Those are the names of the biggest tech companies in New York. The Guild Group is the one to watch. Kevin Ryan, who built DoubleClick here, runs it. It's worth about a billion dollars. He plays a little fast and loose with the numbers, but he's got five or six hundred million in sales. My guess is he's the one to watch. So that could steady New York's economy against the ups and downs of Wall Street a little bit if it continues to grow. There's also a danger? Well, the danger is it'll disappear like it did in the 90s. Some studies think that we had 100,000 Internet-related jobs in the 1990s, in the late 90s. The city. Yeah, the city. I think that's probably a little high, but probably 75,000. We're up to maybe 50,000, 60,000 now in the city. And we could, if all these companies work, if uh, it succeeds, we could get to 100,000 really uh, not only middle class jobs, but upper middle class jobs for techies and ad writers. And the Guild Group has merchandising people. A lot of good jobs there. Regular business commentator, Greg David, thanks a lot. Thank you. Here are this week's five online video picks. Number one represents the limits of good guy hacktivism. The progressive hacker group Anonymous 
has now backed off a plan to expose Mexican government officials working in cahoots with that country's murderous drug cartels. Anonymous backed off after cartel threats of retaliatory killings. Sadly, that diminishes the power of this video released last week in which Anonymous talked tough to the drug lords through their signature Guy Fawkes mask. Anonymous from Veracruz, Mexico, and the world, we want you to know that a member has been kidnapped when he was doing paper storm in our city. We demand his release. We want the army and the navy to know that we are fed up with the criminal group Zetas, who have concentrated on kidnapping, stealing and blackmailing in different ways. One of them is charging every honest and hard-working citizen of Veracruz who busts their rears working day after day to feed their families. We are fed up with taxi drivers, commanders and police Zetas officers of Xalapa, Cordoba, Orizaba, Nogales, Rio Blanco and Camarinos, who are chickens and have made themselves the most loyal servants of these assholes. For the time being, we will not post photos or the names of the taxi drivers, the journalists or the newspapers nor of the police officers, but if needed, we will publish them including their addresses, to see if by doing so the government will arrest them. We cannot defend ourselves with a weapon, but if we can do this with their cars, houses, bars, brothels and everything else in their possession, it will not be difficult. We all know who they are and where they are. You made a huge mistake by taking one of us. Release him. And if anything happens to him, you will always remember this upcoming November 5th. Knowledge is free. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Wait and see. The drug lords did release the hostage referred to in that tape but reportedly threatened to kill 10 people for every cartel name Anonymous revealed. Video pick number two shows the complex relationship between Mayor Bloomberg and Occupy Wall Street. The mayor has mostly defended their free speech rights, but on a breakfast panel with Capital New York took issue with their blaming Wall Street for the financial crisis. What do you say to those people who are part of Occupy? Wall Street. Uh, you know, I, I hear, well, everybody's got a different view of what they're uh, protesting. I hear your complaints. Some of them are totally unfounded. It was not the banks that created the mortgage crisis. It was plain and simple Congress who forced everybody to go and to give mortgages to people who were on the cusp. Now, I'm not so sure that was terrible policy because a lot of those people who got homes still have them, and they wouldn't have had them without that. But they were the ones that pushed Fannie and Freddie to make a bunch of loans that were imprudent, if you will. Uh, they were the ones that pushed the banks to loan to everybody. And now we want to go vilify the banks because it's one target. It's easy to blame them, and Congress certainly isn't going to blame themselves. At the same time, Congress is now trying to pressure banks to loosen their lending standards to make more loans. This is exactly what the, the same speech they criticized them for. Uh, but having said all of that, it, we just got to focus on how we move and get the mortgage business and construction going rather than why we got here and who did it. It's just, you know, it, it's fun and it's cathartic. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's entertaining to go and to blame people and look to the past, but it doesn't do anything for the future. And most of the protesters down there are complaining, I think they should be out there trying to change the world and make it better. And that's what we're trying to do in the city, and that's what people in this room are fundamentally trying to do. Blame the government, not the banks, but so strong was the backlash to that view by the mayor that it led Paul Krugman to call him an ignoramus in the New York Times and led Rolling Stone columnist Matt Taibbi to hurl an F-bomb at Bloomberg in print. Boys, boys. Video pick number three is also Occupy related. Last week, we showed tape of Oakland, California police appearing to hurl tear gas canisters unprovoked into a crowd, injuring a peaceful protester. To be fair, here are some Oakland protesters caught on tape as things have continued to heat up, going beyond peaceful occupying and into violence. <laughs> Oh, 
small group of protesters being cheered on by some but shouted down by many others still it happened and that clip for whatever reason posted on the website of Russia today anything to make the US look bad I guess like people would never get violent in the name of lefty politics in Russia not in Russia video pick number four maybe you remember the incident earlier this year in which a rat was caught on tape crawling on a guy's face on the number four train. We will spare you that video, I promise. But someone by, going by the handle Station Rat has staged a video of his own to argue that the subways are becoming a bad deal. subway with these rats are very disgusting. I was going to actually be riding for free if I had to ride with rats. I'm paying entirely too much money to be riding the subways with rats. We need to keep the fair where it is and get rid of the rats, make it a decent place to ride. The station rat video as shown on Gothamist.com. And video pick number five. You know the issue in New York these days of whether a group of peaceful citizens can just set themselves up in a public place and be there day after day? You know the problems, the noise, the smell, hogging public space all to themselves. No, I don't mean Occupy Wall Street. I'm talking about New York City food trucks. City Council passed a law banning food trunks, trucks from any metered parking spot. Food truck owners are fighting back with this video response. Food truck culture has been part of New York for hundreds of years. Even before trucks started appearing, there have been carts and push carts from the 1700s on. Selling food on the streets is really, really an important part of New York. So I think this Midtown food truck ban uh, is really detrimental to, to the neighborhood of Midtown and really the city of New York. And then I was told, you know, things have changed, you can't be here anymore. And I didn't fight it. I just said, well, I hope this changes eventually, but for now I have to leave. We're losing our number one spot, our number one means to making a living. Sales uh, this summer have been down to about a quarter of what they would normally be in a day. This law that we're, we're dealing with right now, the no vending for meter parking, that law's from 1965. It's almost 50 years old. 
It's really disheartening. There's this fear sort of rippling through the industry. I mean, we've spent a lot of money to build our businesses. No, it's not a storefront rent, but you know, there's a lot of other things that go into it. We're hanging in there and we have employees and it just seems like we serve a purpose and we're actually making something happen. There's a lot of pros that food trucks bring to the table in terms of tax revenue to the city, in terms of jobs, in terms of culinary innovation, tourism, and incubating these small businesses. My name is David Weber and I'm one of the co-founders of Rickshaw Dumpling Truck and I'm the president of the New York City Food Truck Association. There's a lot of smart people really thinking about this in government and in the industry and outside, you know, just third parties that really want to see these, this wide variety of food available to New Yorkers. And I think that if we all come together, there is a solution out there. It feels like a conversation needs to happen between who's, you know, governing these streets and deciding who can and cannot park there and those of us who want to bring a really valuable offering to the city of New York. I think that the food trucks add a lot to the city. And, and I feel like if we lose the food trucks, we're going to lose a very vibrant character. That posted by Save NYC Food Trucks, and those are this week's online video picks. According to defenders of the internet, that fertile ground for free speech and innovation is under assault by big media in the name of copyright protection. The controversy concerns two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate, that corporations want passed, they say, to protect their intellectual property from being pirated. Fair enough. But do these bills go too far? Will they stifle innovation as they protect the Goliaths from all the upstart Davids trying to invent the next Google, the next competitor to the big players? This video from a group called Fight for the Future argues against changing the law. Private corporations want the ability to shut down unauthorized sites where people download movies, TV shows, and music. Since most of these sites are outside U.S. jurisdiction, Protect IP uses a couple different tactics within American borders. Firstly, it gives the government the power to make U.S. Internet providers block access to infringing domain names. They can also sue U.S.-based search engines, directories, or even blogs and forums to have links to these sites removed. Secondly, Protect IP gives corporations and the government the ability to cut off funds to infringing websites by having U.S.-based advertisers and payment services cancel those accounts. In a nutshell, that's what Protect IP will try to do. But in all likelihood, it'll do something else altogether. For starters, it won't stop downloaders. You'll still be able to access a blocked site just by entering its IP address instead of its name. What Protect IP will do is cripple new startups because it also lets companies sue any site they feel isn't doing their filtering well enough. These lawsuits could easily bankrupt new search engines and social media sites. And Protect IP's wording is ambiguous enough that important social media sites could become targets. Lots of trailblazing websites could look like piracy havens to the wrong judge. Tumblr, SoundCloud, and early YouTube, wherever people express themselves, make art, broadcast news, or organize protests, there's plenty of TV footage, movie clips, and copyrighted music mixed in. And even if you trust the U.S. government not to abuse their new power to censor the net, what about the countries that follow in our path and pass similar laws? People around the world will have very different internets, and unscrupulous governments will have powerful tools to hinder free expression. But perhaps most dangerously, Protect IP will meddle with the inner workings of the net. Experts believe by fiddling with the web's registry of domain names, the result will be less security and less stability. In short, Protect IP won't stop piracy, but it will introduce vast potential for censorship and abuse while making the web less safe and less reliable. Joining us now via Skype to explain the bill's implications is Corinne McSherry. She is Director of Intellectual Property at the Electronic Freedom Foundation. Thanks for coming back on. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's uh, unpack the acronym SOUP a little bit first. Protect IP in the Senate is the Preventing Real Online Threats to Economic Creativity and Theft of Intellectual Property Act. Wow. The E-Parasites House Bill stands for Enforcing and Protecting American Rights Against Sites Intent on Theft and Exploitation. Hooey, long names, but they sound like they're after good causes. You don't think so? Um, I don't think so. I mean, 
I think we can all agree that there is a problem with online infringement, that there's quite a lot of infringing activity happening online. But it's quite another thing um, to accept this, these bills as a solution. They're actually really dangerous solutions. They're going to cause all kinds of collateral damage, and they're not actually going to fix the problem. How would it affect innovation or job growth, in your opinion? Well, one of the worst provisions in this bill is the so-called follow the money provision, and it's in the uh, e-parasites bill. And what it allows private people to do, not the government, but individual rights holders to do, is to send a notice to Visa, MasterCard, PayPal that says a portion of this site has, uh, is enabling or facilitating infringement or hasn't tried hard enough to stop infringement. So we want you to cut off uh, processing payments for this entire account. So what that means as a practical matter is if you have one page on your site that's got some infringing activity on it, someone can send a notice to Visa or MasterCard or PayPal and say, cut these people off. That's it. So imagine, you know, the next YouTube. Right? Can you be sure that there's not, not a single thing in there that's on, on a hosting site that doesn't have anything infringing? Probably not. That's going to be very difficult to be sure of. And so what it does is it chokes off the economic lifeblood for, for, for new startups. And that currently they rely on something called the DMCA safe harbors. And the safe harbors essentially protected innovation by saying, look, if you take steps to respond when you get a notice about infringement on your site, you respond quickly, you, you are protected, you can't be sued out of existence. Well, what's going to happen under these new provisions is no one's going to bother with the safe harbors. They're just going to go straight to sending a notice to Visa, and they're going to choke you off within five days. There is a real problem with piracy and theft of intellectual property out there, so do you think that the laws we have are good enough to deal with it? Well, I think that the laws that we have are the realistic ways of dealing with it. Um, we have laws that are in place that say all you, if you see something infringing online and you're a legitimate rights holder, all you have to do is send an email and the service provider is going to take that content down and they have to do that quickly. So we, we have provisions. It's just that Hollywood's decided that they, don't, they didn't like the bargain that they made when they established the DMCA and its provisions. Um, which is kind of ironic because before the DMCA, if you wanted to have content taken down, you'd actually have to go to court and get a court order, which is a lot of work. Now you only have to send an email. In my book, that's pretty easy. So bottom line, do you think this is actually going to pass Congress, either of these bills, or is this a way for the production houses to try to put pressure on the tech companies to come to the table and structure some kind of new deal? Well, it may be the latter. There's an awful lot of clout behind this bill. A lot of old money and old media is pushing it really hard. Unfortunately, uh, the tech industry has really woken up with this and realized that they need to push back hard and be a presence in D.C. that they haven't been before. So, you know, I remain hopeful that we'll fight this one off, but I don't know that this is going to be the end of it. Corinne McSherry from EFF, thank you very much. Thank you. After a break making websites accessible to people with disabilities. Ma, guess what? I went back to college. No, I didn't quit my job. I'm finishing my degree with a CUNY online bachelor's in business. I interact online with real City University of New York faculty on a schedule that fits my busy life. Ma, you should look who's teaching at CUNY. And it all leads to a high quality bachelor of science degree in business. I can attend class anywhere, anytime, Yes, Mom, even at your house Friday night for dinner. The CUNY Online Baccalaureate. Get back to business. Welcome to the Solar Generation Road Trip. If you want to know how solar energy is working for America, you have to go out and ask America. We're talking to people from coast to coast who are using solar power every day. From a few panels on a homeowner's roof to large solar plants with enough utility power for a whole town. Solar energy is working for America now, saving us money, creating new jobs, and giving our world a brighter future. Go solar! Welcome to the solar generation. Into each life, a little rain must fall. And what rains on our cities flows into what we drink. The Arbor Day Foundation invites you to plant trees in your community. So the water that flows into our rivers and streams will be clean and safe. 
Visit ArborDay.org to find out how to plant the right trees in the right place and support Tree City USA where you live. Go to ArborDay.org. What have you used the web for in the last month? Maybe you applied for a job, took a college exam, or renewed your driver's license. Chances are good you logged on to Facebook to stay in touch with friends. Well, the Internet has become an invaluable tool for leading our day-to-day -day lives, we don't have to tell you, but less so for many people with disabilities. The vast majority of websites are not accessible to everyone, even though the technology to make them accessible is out there. Jonathan Lazar is a professor of computer and information sciences at Towson University, whose research focuses on making the web open to everyone. He joins us via Skype from Towson, Maryland. Hello, welcome to the program. Hello from New York. Hi, Brian. Happy to be on the show. First, what disabilities are we talking about primarily? Because I think when the bulk of the audience hears the term disability accessible, the first thing that comes to mind is wheelchairs, which is not the issue here. Right. Well, uh, inter interface research on people with disabilities actually covers everything from people who are blind, people who are deaf, people who have dexterity challenges, so limited use of hands or no use of hands, people with spinal cord injuries. There's also research into uh, computer usage by people with Alzheimer's disease, people with Down syndrome, people with autism. So really, in terms of research, it covers everything. The, uh, the guidelines that are used by the federal government and come from international standards bodies, they tend to be uh, focused a little bit more on perceptual and motor impairment. So we're talking about people who are blind, people uh, who are deaf, people who have either limited or no use of hands, people who are using an alternative keyboard, people who can't use any keyboard. Um, but slowly those guidelines are now addressing more and those laws are starting to address more people with different cognitive impairments as well. So is there anything like the Americans with Disabilities Act for the web? Uh, there are actually a few different laws that relate to website accessibility. Uh, one of them is the Americans with Disabilities Act that, that you mentioned, but let's actually first start with Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. And Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act covers all federal technology, so all federal government technology. Um, that means websites, that means hardware, software, operating systems, you name it, um, iPhones, anything like that. So Section 508 covers federal websites. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, since that was signed into law in 1990, that originally wasn't written to cover websites because that was before the time of the web. But um, over time, the Justice Department has said that ADA applies to the web. And also, um, there are a number of court cases that have said that the Americans with Disabilities Act does apply to websites. So if you are covered as a public accommodation under the ADA, so, you know, we're talking about stores, shopping centers, libraries, hotels, um, any state and local government, any entity covered under the ADA as a public accommodation has to make their website uh, accessible. And there's a more recent law called the 21st Century Communications Video and Video Accessibility Act. Uh, and that law deals with things like, for instance, uh, video online, making sure that the video is closed captioned. So uh, there are actually three different laws at this point that uh, specifically do relate to so, websites. So these laws are already in place. You're talking about three different laws, and yet you're saying it's not really happening. Are companies just flaunting the law? Uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I've learned that over the last few years. There's a big difference between having a law in place and having compliance. And so, for instance, if you look at the federal websites, uh, a lot of them don't follow the law. It's not that you need a new law. It's that you need someone monitoring and you need to have compliance requirements. And, and here's a great example. Uh, by law, the Justice Department, every two years, is actually supposed to do studies right, to evaluate whether or not federal uh, agencies are complying with Section 508. For almost a decade, the Justice Department did not do their compliance studies. They didn't document. Now, they've started again recently. So they sent out a survey to start the process at the beginning of 2011. Um, but very often what's happened, it's been the advocacy groups, you know, groups like the National Federation of the Blind, who have gone out there and filed lawsuits to really uh, enforce the law. Give me an example of a technology that makes uh, the web or computers more accessible to people with a given disability? Absolutely. Uh, people who are blind very often use a technology known as screen reader. A screen reader like JAWS or Window Eyes or VoiceOver allows them to hear what's on the screen with computer-synthesized speech output. Right? 
So they basically listen to a web page, and they can type in on a keyboard just a, as most users would do. Uh, they don't need to see the keyboard to know what it is that they're typing. Um, as another example, there might be people even who have a repetitive strain injury. You know, they've been typing too long uh, at the computer. They've got some type of wrist injury, you know, carpal tunnel, something like that. They may not be able to use a pointing device. And so all of these, um, the guidelines actually actually relate. It's not just you put in one design feature for someone who's blind and one for someone who's deaf. If you follow the guidelines, if you follow the regulations, they cover a, a lot of various impairments, including, again, people who maybe can't use a mouse currently uh, because they have RSI, some type of repetitive strain injury. So, But there are a number of different assistive technologies. Uh, people who are deaf, for instance, tend to focus on closed captioning and transcripts. Right? They can see the video, but they need to be able to get the closed captioning for a web-based video. You've got people who may use speech input, people who have a spinal cord injury and may use speech input to operate their computer. So you have a, a lot of different assistive technologies and approaches, and really the idea behind accessibility is making your web page flexible. Because if it's flexible, it will work well if you've got people using different input and output approaches. Is this not happening because it's expensive? Uh, it, well, it hasn't happened for a number of reasons, I think. Um, it's actually not expensive if you design accessibility in when you build it. So if you want an example, if you're going to build a new house, right, to make sure that that house is wheelchair accessible costs almost nothing. You know, you have to make sure the doors are a little bit wider. You have to make sure that you've got ramps in place. You have to make sure that you have the right type of uh, door handles. But the reality is it costs almost nothing. Now, if you want to go into a craftsman house built in the 1920s, Right? And you want to try to go ahead there and make the doorways wider and you know, different entries, that costs more money. And so really you see the same thing with websites, whereas if you build with accessibility in mind, right, it costs almost nothing to make it accessible. You're actually just following coding standards. You're following good coding standards. So inaccessible websites essentially are websites that have not followed good coding standards. They don't have the appropriate uh, markup. So that there's equivalent behind the scenes, there's equivalent text, there are equivalent descriptions and labeling, that should be there anyway. That's all people with disabilities typically need. So if you have a very inaccessible website, it's probably poorly coded is, is really the idea because it doesn't have to change the way the website looks. You shouldn't be able to look at a website and say, oh, that website is accessible or it's inaccessible. Right? The look so. shouldn't change. It's the back-end coding. And so most companies, most agencies, change their website design every two to three years. The next redesign is a great time to improve accessibility and really make a difference there. Well, good luck in your battle to make this happen more, and thanks for raising our awareness about it. Hey, my pleasure. Happy to be here. As New Yorkers, we have to live with air pollution. We certainly have to live with noise pollution. But there's a third kind of pollution that plagues our town, visual pollution. Take a look. See this like massive vinyl billboard for Hennessy up here, right? There's a code that says there can't be a billboard within 100 feet of a park over a half an acre. We called it in on May 5th of 2008, and on October 3rd, a building inspector came and determined that it's illegal. This company is basically breaking the law every month and getting away with it. Outdoor advertising companies and marketers are outside influences. They don't care about you. They don't care about your neighborhood. They care about your eyeballs. See these trees right here? Somebody cut these trees to allow visibility to the billboard. It's so bright, I almost hit some pedestrians. The likelihood of that driver getting into a crash goes up by double. And the billboard industry simply says, we don't care. When you go out on a street and look and see nothing but a big clutter of signs, what else is that other than visual pollution? You're all fighting for space, and the space that actually is not yours. Art, the woods, one of them is motivated by commerce. The other one's motivated by personal motivation, which, by the way, is also meant to be sold. Cannot distinguish oftentimes between commercial matter and programming. If something's not profitable, it's not valuable. And so we've basically given up on things that may not make a lot of money. The majority of the work I see now feels that this intrusion on your life is worthwhile. And I think it's insulting. 
there's a few things that we're trying to accomplish through this action. One of them, obviously, is to send a message to the city of Toronto that we want to take our space back. This fight against outdoor advertising is a part of reconquering that space, that it's been usurped by private messages. For the city to buy and sell our space is awful. They're all <laughs> suited up. Oh my god, this is so crazy. Oh, Lord, protect all these people. The use of public space for outdoor advertising is indicative of how we treat our public. It's up to the public to regain control of that space. The stuff just didn't appear, and if it appeared, it can disappear. That is the trailer for This Space Available, a documentary that premiered at Doc NYC, a local documentary film festival, this week. Its director, Gwena L. Gobe, is here with me now, along with her father, Mark Gobe. He executive produced this space available. He's also known as a marketing guru who wrote the book Emotional Branding, among other things. So welcome, both of you, to the show. Thank you, Brian. Hi, Brian. And this grew out of a conversation or even a debate that the two of you had. Uh, had tell us about it. I would call it more of a, a debate. <laughs> um, Mark, uh, my dad wanted to make a, a short clip about uh, branding and what was going on in branding at the time. And he read the news that Sao Paulo was taking down all their billboards. And he was shocked. He was like, oh, this would be great to, to cover. Um, so he called me, and I read the news, and I was thrilled. I was like, this is the greatest news. We should absolutely cover this. So um, he thought, oh, this is going to be great because everybody's going to be pissed off. and we're going to have a great video. But then we went to Sao Paulo and we interviewed advertisers and we interviewed people that worked in brands and people, the mayor, we interviewed the mayor and they all had positive things to say about the law. And you thought what? Ah, oh, rebellious youth. She's turning against the very core of my being. Yeah, exactly. And uh, plus she told me, she said, listen, if I do this, uh, this movie with you, I want total creative control. And I said, that's typical of a Gen Y <laughs> attitude. But when we went you know, down there, I realized, particularly after interviewing the mayor, that he was not so much against billboard, that, it, it, that he was about protecting the identity of his city and the image of his city. And that the billboards, you know, the brands were destroying that image. And, and that was a big revelation to me because so, suddenly I made a connection, you know, between the people living in cities, you know, the quality of life, you know, in cities, and what the brands, you know, were doing there. And you were surprised, I understand, by the reaction of the business community to the billboard ban in Sao Paulo, yes? The, the business community actually was all for it because there is this uh, competition that exists, you know, between brands where... Uh, if my billboard, you know, is that size, then, you know, mine need to be double that size. And, and everybody was following up orders that were not aesthetic, that they knew, you know, were destroying the environment, but commerce, you know, was driving it. And uh, suddenly, everybody was back to the same, uh, to the same base. Sao Paulo isn't the only city in the film. Well, from Sao Paulo, the film grew because... Um, uh, when we got back to L.A., there was a huge article in the L.A. Weekly that talked about the illegal uh, billboards that, was, that were there, and there was a huge court case. So we went and we, th we thought, oh, we should definitely follow that story. And then from that story, we heard about uh, Jordan in New York who uh, paints over illegal billboards and billboards and replaces them with art. And then we heard about um, somewhere in Mumbai, the, a company is cutting trees to increase the visibility of billboards. And so it kind of took us to all these different countries around the world where there were different stories about people fighting billboards. What? Houston was a great story also. Houston has banned billboards, right? Yes, it's correct. Actually, Houston banned all new billboards and created a moratorium for old billboards. So there's not actually a law that bans billboards, uh -huh. but it's you. They, each time one, an old one becomes old, they take it down and then they're not allowed to put a new one up after that. Why do you think in Houston, of all American cities, that wouldn't seem like the Texas attitude? Which is why I really wanted to go there because, first of all, they don't have zoning in that city, um, and they're, they're very Republican, and I thought, oh. They don't, when you say they don't have zoning, that means anybody can build anything anywhere. Exactly. 
anywhere. You, if you want to put a giant flower on top of your house, you can do that in Houston. Um, and so I thought, oh, I really want to cover this story because I don't want to think that only liberals are touched by this by this issue, or only people in big cities are touched with this issue. Or um, so Houston was great because it was people that that thought about it in a business sense. They said, oh, this is bad for the the is bad for the city of Houston to to have billboards because it's taking away from the experience of Houston. And people won't want to come and live here and work here if it's not an agreeable place to live. So if she is actually making you sympathetic to this cause, which it seems like is We happening. now agree on something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not what to have for dinner, but you agree on this. Um, how would that change the work that you do? If you're doing marketing strategies for major corporations that have used billboards in the past, how would you advise them differently? Well, you know, the, uh, the strategy for any brand is to stand up, you know, among the clutter, to stand up among, you know, the clutter of, of uh, you know, information that we are surrounded with. And, uh, and now I realize that actually they are trying to stand out, you know, from the clutter by creating more clutter. And, uh, and my point to them is, is to say, stop. Stop, this is ridiculous, you know, this is going the wrong way, and not only that, but this is offending not only your customers, but this is offending everybody. Is there an example you can give us without, you know, breaching any client uh, confidentiality that you need to keep of somebody you advised in this way and they changed and moved away from billboards? This, is, this film is very new, and this film just came out. And, uh, uh, and I've had, you know, private conversation with, uh, you know, with some brands. Some brands uh, realize that indeed they, they, they have to move away from, you know, the type of marketing that they used yeah. to do in the past, which was to push a message and, and try to understand better, you know, their impact on the community. So the conversation is going on, and I think this film will do that. Is there an echo of Occupy Wall Street in this, though in a very different way? but in the sense of the people taking back public space from the corporations? Um, I think there is. Um, I mean, public space, as, as Marcelo Dantas in our film says, who's an architect in Sao Paulo, he says, um, s space belongs to everyone. It's not, that space is not yours. And when you see 2,000 to 5,000 ads a day, or if you see a, when you're driving on the highway, you see an ad every one second, mm -hmm. then your, your brain is hurt. Mm -hmm. And I feel strongly that it's inappropriate to be treated as a consumer every space that you go, especially in public spaces, which is uh, somewhere we, sh we should be able to share different things. Like you shouldn't be able to be, you shouldn't be addressed as a consumer everywhere that you go. There should be space for you to read a book or enjoy a tree or some greenery. What, what, would, be, what would be your New York version of this? Because people who live here may not love the lights of Times Square and all those neon billboards, but they also may think, well, it's Times Square, it's very New York, and it brings in the tourists. Well, the film is not saying, let's ban all billboards. Uh, we're saying there is an excess in commercial media in all spaces, and it's inappropriate to be a consumer all the time. There are spaces for that. Times Square, you know, they put those seats up, and people seem to love it. They sit down and look at the. I mean, I'm excited that they do, and that's exciting. Um, but I don't think that should be uh, an outside the window of your house or in a park or even a school. I mean, we interviewed this woman called Carrie McLaren who said that she showed students um, pictures of trees from the neighborhood where they lived and they couldn't recognize one, any of them or name them. But then she showed them an alphabet with just one letter of brands around their neighborhoods and they could tell and name each one of them. So what is going on in their heads and what is occupying our brains? Is it just a lot of brands and a lot of billboards or is there space for other things? Uh, the last screening of the film, I understand, at the Doc NYC Festival was today. Is there somewhere that people can see this online or something if they want to check it out? I think that uh, for us, the uh, Doc NYC was the beginning of, uh, you know, of. Uh, uh, of our work and our message. And I think a lot of people we found out are really interested to, uh, you know, to view the film and to uh, get the film. And our work you know, now is to make sure that everybody sees it. Thank you very much for sharing You're it with welcome. us.
And um, check out on the website, which is thespaceavailablefilm.com. Thispaceavailablefilm.com. Yes. Thank it you. Has Thank you very much. Finally tonight, with the turning back of our clocks by one hour this past weekend, here is a brief case against Daylight Savings Time by C.G.P. Gray, the time management expert, uh, experts. Take our use of light bulbs, for example. Technology gets better and better and better. More electricity is dedicated to things that aren't light bulbs, and the lure of a hot, sweaty, mosquito-filled day outside is less appealing than technological entertainment and climate-controlled comfort inside. Also, the horrifically energy-inefficient tungsten light bulbs that have remained unchanged for a century are giving way to CFLs and LEDs, greatly reducing the amount of energy required to light a room. So, even assuming that daylight saving time is effective, it's probably less effective with every passing year. The bottom line is while some studies say daylight saving time costs more electricity and others say it saves electricity, the one thing they agree on is the effect size. Not 20% or 10%, but 1% or less, which, in the United States, works out to be about $4 per household. $4 saved or spent on electricity over an entire year is not really a huge deal either way. So the question now becomes, is the hassle of switching clocks twice a year worth it? The most obvious trouble comes from sleep deprivation, an already too common affliction in the Western world that daylight saving time makes measurably worse. With time tracking software, we can actually see that people are less productive the week after the clock changes. This comes with huge associated costs. To make things worse, most countries take away that hour of sleep on a Monday morning. Sleep deprivation can lead to heart attacks and suicides, and the daylight saving time Monday has a higher than normal spike in both. Other troubles come from scheduling meetings across time zones. Let's say you're trying to plan a three-way conference between New York, London, and Sydney. Not an easy thing to do under the best of circumstances, but made extra difficult when they don't agree on when daylight saving time should start and end. In the spring, Sydney is 11 hours ahead of London and New York is 5 hours behind. But then New York is the first to enter daylight saving time and moves its clock forward an hour. Two weeks later, London does the same. In one more week, Sydney, being on the opposite side of the world, leaves daylight saving time and moves its clock back an hour. So in the space of three weeks, New York is 5 hours behind London, then 4 hours, then 5 again, and Sydney is either 11, 10, or 9 hours from London, and 16, 15, or 14 hours from New York. And this whole crazy thing happens again in reverse six months later. Back in the Dark Ages, this might not have mattered so much, but in the modern interconnected world, planning international meetings happens thousands and thousands of times daily. Shifting in inconsistent time zones isn't doing netizens any favors. And that's it for this week's show. We premiere a new episode Wednesday nights at, well, what we arbitrarily call this time of year, 7.30 p.m., or see us anytime at CUNY.tv. Next week, do startups create jobs or destroy them? And check out my daily radio show, weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC. Tomorrow morning, trending topics in psychotherapy, relationships, and money. That's on 93.9 FM and AMA 20 WNYC. Talk to you then.